Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Ben Wichley of Supersize Media coming straight at you live from the She Means Business Scotland Facebook group. So basically, we've got some amazing guests today. We've got the gorgeous Lindsay Leroy from the Scottish Design Exchange. Hi. We've got Sevilla Voragi, who's, uh, who's about uh, helping uh, you to be able to achieve all your ambitions and come from a place of wonderful abundance in order to do that. And then we've also got Helen Carlin of the Rowan Alva uh, charity, homeless charity. Uh, so we've got some fantastic topics coming up today from these uh, outstanding women that we've picked today. We've got why the homeless sector is not fit for purpose. That's what Helen's going to be telling us about. Uh, why the homeless sector is uh, traditionally not actually doing the job it's supposed to be doing. So very controversial stuff. stuff. Uh, from Lindsay, we're going to be hearing how to shop more ethically in Scotland. And she's got some fantastic uh, prize-winning activities um, that you can participate in as well to, in order to help the, the artists uh, and also, also all the, uh, the people in, in Edinburgh particularly. And then from Sabia, we're going to find out the three simple steps for asking what you actually want. All right. So let me first, before we actually start talking to our amazing guests, I'd like to first just tell you a little bit about She Means Business. She Means Business Scotland was set up uh, by Facebook and Enterprise Nation, which is an organization in England, but which has now become much more of a UK wide uh, feature. If you go onto Enterprise Nation website, you'll see there's loads and loads of support there available for all kinds of small businesses and startup businesses and charities as well. You're going to be able to see uh, all kinds of support, all the most latest up to date information to do with coronavirus support for business and support for the self employed. There's, e there's even a campaign on there called Pay It Forward where they're working in collaboration with Crowdfunder to be able to help support businesses uh, get some kind of funding through so that they can keep it uh, going. So they, they have like loads of journalists in there, loads of marketing experts like myself as trainers in there. And then they have the She Means Business uh, feature, which is in collaboration with Facebook. So then Facebook uh, gets us, all the trainer, all the top, top trainers across the UK, to uh, actually go around uh, our areas and deliver training for women because we all know that when women get to uh, develop businesses and charities and social enterprises then the whole economy rises massively because of the fact that we build for sustained uh, results you know we always want to make sure that the community rises with us we always want to make sure that we're building for the long term not for a quick sellout in three years time so that's why Facebook has been massively involved in making sure that uh, trainers like myself are going around and making sure that women are getting all the training that they need on Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and uh, Messenger as well. And one of the things you really need to realize that is that nowadays, you know, you can't, you can't do those kind of face-to-face, in-person kind of uh, meetings. We're doing them all online. And this is why we've got the the Facebook group, the She Means Business Scotland group, in order to make sure everybody's collaborating. We've got over 300 people in the group now, and we're gonna make it a lot more dynamic. So far, it's just been a weekly interviews and monthly training. In fact, next week, we've got a training session, social media training session for you guys as well, so it's gonna be fun. Uh, but we're also gonna make it a lot more interactive in the group so that we can support you uh, in whatever stage of business or charity you're involved in at the moment. Uh, so, uh, so let me give you some uh, latest news that might be useful for you as well. Uh, there's some new funds that have been released. Uh, there's new funds being released all the time to help uh, with uh, businesses and charities survive through this debacle that we're experiencing. We can't, we can't find a whole there's a, there's a limit to the number of words you can use to describe this particular situation that we're in. Uh, but the Scottish Government has announced a £100 million fund to support the newly self-employed and SMEs. So people in the creative, tourism and hospitality enterprises 
there's going to be grants for up to 2,500 uh, to help with hardship and things like that. So there's loads and loads of resources out there. Uh, these ones have been announced, but they're actually not live yet, but it's something to look at. Have a look at the Scottish Enterprise website and they'll, uh, they'll point you to in the direction of all the funds and uh, grants that you can be applying for in order to uh, keep, keep, uh, keep, their, to keep your organization afloat or even uh, start up your enterprise. Because at the end of the day, they're also looking for forward thinking and innovative thinking people who are gonna be able to find ways to dig ourselves out of not just this current situation, but the situation when we finish, you know, because this, this coming out of lockdown is gonna take a long, long time. There's gonna be potentially between 30 and 50% unemployment on a, on a seriously long-term basis. As, uh, as, the, as the economies across the world start trying to work out how do we recover from this. So everybody's looking for innovative people, ideas, thoughts, strategies that we can all help to collaborate on to uh, solve this problem called Corona. Okay, so let's start chatting with our first guest then. We have the wonderful Helen Carlin who I have to admit, I'm, I've been on the board with Helen for the last, I don't know, four or five years or so. And it's been an absolute eye opener because um, Rawan Alba is, is so particular in how they operate. Helen, do you wanna give us a quick introduction to what Rawan Alba is all about? Thanks, Finn, and hello to everybody else. Um, a quick introduction. So I set up Ryan Alba around 20 years ago and one of the first things that we did was establish a home for life to get guys off the streets, giving them a full Scottish secure tenancy. And at the time a lot of people thought that was a bit bonkers, myself included. But anyway, we, we persisted with it and we have housed over 70 men aged 50 plus who come to us directly from the streets. Now, um, up until recently, there were about 120, 130 homeless people living on the streets of Edinburgh. They've all been taken in to hotels for their temporarily housed. So at the moment, the stuff that I did years ago just doesn't look so daft anymore. Um, and has become very topical. Um, there's been a thing called Housing First that you may have heard about. It's been a big central plank in the government's um, plans to eradicate homelessness. And it was hailed as a new idea, which is bollocks, because we've been doing it for a long, long time, very successfully. However, the problem with Housing First is that it uses the accommodation that we've already had we already have it doesn't bring one bit of new accommodation in and that's such a problem in homelessness because there just isn't enough affordable accommodation so we've hit on a an idea that i've been um, playing with in the last year but i'm on full throttle development off now um, so i'm setting up a new organization called common ground against homelessness and within the next two or three weeks, we'll be going live and asking the public to invest in just going and buying accommodation. And we will be rewarding our investors with a, the end of year two, a three year, a 3% uh, dividend. So it's, um, yeah, 3% philanthropy. So that's what I'm up to. Yeah, so it's incredible. So tell, so tell us about the real kind of barriers that have been happening so far. I mean, at the moment, we've got, ma or, you know, obviously, we've got the situation where people are being put into, into hotels. But uh, prior to that, you know, what was happening to people who were, who had lots of addiction issues, for example, and who were homeless? Well, the, the would be tossed out of temporary accommodation because of their addiction issues. Um, a lot of temporary accommodation doesn't allow you to drink, doesn't allow you to continue with their addiction. So if you have a, a major addiction, you're not going to come in off the streets. So there was basically nowhere for them. And I guess, you know, while I'm delighted that people have come in off the streets, I'm also somewhat appalled that it had to take a situation where 
homeless people because they couldn't self-isolate were worthy of accommodating. The problem with the accommodation that they have is it, it is in hotels and uh, I know from working closely with the City of Edinburgh Council that they were awash with offers of accommodation and then after the furlough scheme was announced 90% of those offers were pulled. Yes. Yeah. So the, the, there's not a lot of um, altruism in what's going on at the moment. It's better to get £10 a night for your hotel room for a homeless person than have your hotel completely empty. So my point is, what the hell is going to happen once lockdown is lifted to the extent that hotels start to fill up again? And tell me more about the kind of nature of the, the homeless person. I mean, there's all different kinds of categories of homeless people, right? So there's some charities that are good at helping people who've uh, overspent, you know, they've, uh, they're a bit short of cash, they've not got their deposit and stuff like that. But here with Rowan Abbey, we're, we're actually talking about people who've got what we call child, adverse childhood uh, trauma sometimes. So how does that manifest? Well, you it would manifest, I suppose, in what some other charities would term um, lack of engagement with support. It would manifest possibly as, as violence or what is termed challenging behaviour. Um, and again, years ago, we, we became curious as to what, what all this was about. So when the whole psychologically informed environment and the whole ACE adverse childhood experience thing came up, it just made perfect sense to us because the, the amount of people that we work with who've been sexually abused or just basically had a, a rubbish start in life it's not surprising to see that that's what happens. Yeah, so it's pretty tricky for a lot of people who find themselves in a homeless situation. If you give them a house, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be able to maintain it because of the way that they have experienced trauma. Absolutely, and I'll give you a, a nice example, which is, so at Thorn Tree, where we've housed 70 people, um, over the years since it's been open. In, in all that time, we've had one eviction and that was for a serious assault. We've been asked to take, so the, the chap in question ended up in prison and on release from prison, he's been living in a housing first flat, getting visit and support. And we've been asked to take him back at Thorn Tree because it's not enough. And of course, he's coming back to us once, once we can accommodate him and safely achieve that transfer because a lot of the solutions to homelessness come from what I would call way up on high and policy decisions that are made by people that live in comfortable houses that look to research and say oh that's a jolly good idea but they haven't actually gone through that themselves so what seems to you or me like a jolly good idea from our middle class, comfortable, privileged perspective often just doesn't cut the mustard for a lot of folk. Yeah, so I mean a lot of the people that you're dealing with in Rowan Alba are basically homeless people who have been made homeless by the homeless sector. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> there's two, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. There's, there's, there's your what I would call sort of entrenched homeless person and that's what we that's what we think about when we think about homeless people um, often associated with addiction the another bit of what we do is we have temp accommodation for women and I think what the general public has to realize is that if you look at the homeless population in Edinburgh then at the other side of the extreme it's a problem caused by affordability in housing so that in our 10 women at Stramillion, which is our temp accommodation for women, four of them are working. And it's so, housing has become so, affordable housing has become so inaccessible, so difficult to access that these women, although they can hold down a job on a, on a, on a low wage, just around the living wage, can't find anywhere to move to. 
So you've got two opposite ends of the scale and they're both as they're both as serious and they're both as in my mind community related because it's the community that kind of causes the problem in some ways. Can, can I ask a question to Helen? <clears throat> um, Helen, what's been the impact of the Airbnb um, well up until now um, in Edinburgh with that um, <clears throat> and do you think now that we're on um, a situation where there's not tourists going to be coming probably for um, at least this year in Edinburgh with all these empty houses in our community um, they're everywhere I'm, I'm in Leith and I mean you see the little docket things to get in all over the place yeah. you know what's the impact that being on on the homeless situation um, and can you see any way of that improving and not going back to having all these um, probably empty properties now um, sitting, sitting there? It's a great question, thanks. The, I'm, I've been heavily influenced by a guy called uh, David Donison, who, is it David Donison? Something like that, anyway. Um, and he refers to something called the commodity, sorry, I, this is really heavy arse, isn't it? But he refers to something called the commoditization of housing. Mm -hmm. So in theory, there are, there's enough housing in the UK, but if you have a situation where somebody owns three, four or five houses, or 12. I know people who own 12 Airbnbs. So, and there's where, there's where you get the, 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 the sticky situation coming in. Now, I'll take High Street as an example. I moved through to Edinburgh all oh, yonks ago, 30 plus years ago, and worked for the City of Edinburgh Council and uh, for four years. And at that time, there were 60,000 council houses um, and they would be affordable. And actually, we had a fair few miscellaneous properties on up and down the high street, where a lot of interesting individuals lived, one bed flats. Now, we had a guy living with us at Thorntree uh, for 14 years. And I remember going to visit him in that flat before we took him in. He was very isolated. He was deemed to be aggressive and a, a menace to society. Uh, but actually, he was very vulnerable. He was hungry. He, he was being financially abused by younger people. So we took him in. And then about four years ago, uh, a friend of a friend bought the flat in Westport that he used to live in. And then they went on to buy a couple more. And they're all Airbnb. So a lot of the Airbnb properties used to belong to the council and could be you know, with affordable housing. The Edinburgh has 14% social rented housing. The national average is 25. So mm. what's to be done? I, I, I think we need to do something policy-wise about um, taking back housing for people. Mm -hmm. Not quite a revolution, but to be honest, not far off it. And I think if you look at the City of Edinburgh Council's strategy, for when we come out of this, has to be less reliant on tourism. Yes. And I, I think as, as well with the Airbnb, with what's happened now, you know, Edinburgh Festival's been cancelled, possibly even the New Year celebrations will be cancelled. Um, and I think a lot of these people who have 12 Airbnbs might not be able to sustain that. Um, you know, maybe they are wealthy people and they've bought them for cash, I doubt it, but most mm -hmm. of them have mortgages, um, so we might see an influx of property coming onto the market that they can't sell. Um, and I would hope to see something from the government that can maybe take over some of these properties and um, use them for, for um, the homeless in the city. Um, and as you say, not just the homeless that we sort of see around, yeah, um, off. but families and um, put our communities back. So Helen, let me ask you then, so when, when you were looking at uh, extending Thorntree, the model that you were going to be using was uh, to go and find a property and get an extended lease on that. But you discovered that it was, uh, there was going to be too much profit, you know, basically you're paying a landlord, uh, you're, pay you're, somebody, you're making somebody rich, uh, there's a lot of profits to be made out of homelessness, essentially. So, so you're now trying to go into this new kind of funding model 
where uh, you're getting investors, social investors, yeah. go in and actually participate in purchasing properties. So you're taking those profits out of the kind of property market in order to provide a sustainable solution for homelessness. I couldn't have said that better myself. And that's, <laughs> that is exactly what we're doing. So to give you another example, um, a couple of years ago, we expressed interest in a 14 bed HMO, house and multiple occupation. We were going to use that for supported accommodation for homeless women who were fairly traumatized and, and needed 24 hour support. And to kick off, the owner wanted 56,000 for the rent. So we built up a, a, a model around the support, around that. At the end of the day, he was so desperate to, to make money out. It went to open tender and somebody took it over as a backpackers hostel uh, and paid 75,000 pound rent. I went to see them um, and it was quite interesting because he, he got out his spreadsheet and told me how much he was throwing at booking.com and then said, well, the next time the council want bed and breakfast accommodation, I'll go to them because then I can employ one member of staff and it's easy money. And for those of you that don't know, the city of Edinburgh Council, in common with other major cities, but worse because of the impact of tourism here, annually pays six million pounds. Six million pounds of our money goes to B and B owners. And then the interesting thing is as well that when homeless people go and stay in Air in B and Bs they get chucked out after breakfast. They have to walk the streets. So, so it has a massive effect on particularly families as well, because they're not allowed to be in that premises until five o'clock in the evening again. The City of Edinburgh Council, to be fair, have done a lot of work to, to, to improve, to bring up the standards. But again, it's an issue of availability. Mm -hmm. You know, and it is, and I do, this is, why I feel very passionate about setting up the common ground against homelessness, because if we if we had a giant marketing division, we'd be going out right now and say, "Oh, support us in the coronavirus crisis," or we we do a big Christmas appeal. And I hate that kind of stuff because homeless people are with us all the year round. You know, it's a systemic failure on our society. We've, we've created a them and an us. Yeah. It's, it's the policies and it's, and it's the, you know, greed is not good. I, I'm not, I have no problem with people making money. No problem, that's, that's not my issue. My issue is that we have driven accommodation to a, a, all we see it, it is the profit, not if, you know, if we own five flats and they're all Airbnb, great, but the impact on our, particularly in Edinburgh, the impact on our community has, has it's fractured our community. So on that note, we're just going to have to leave it there. Uh, Helen, what, tell everybody where they can find out more information from you, get hold of you and support what you're doing as well. Um, if you drop an email to info at rowanalba.org. We'll get back to you. We haven't got the website for um, Common Ground Against Homelessness up and running yet, but it's just a matter of time. And I mean, who, who thinks this is a good idea and it will work? Yes, I do. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Because all... we, we've got to move beyond charity. It's we need solidarity with poorer people in our community. It worked for student flats, so... Yeah. Brilliant. On that note, thank you so much, Helen. Please stay around uh, as we carry on having uh, chats with everybody else. And let me introduce you now to Miss Lindsay Leroy. Hi, Lindsay. Hi. I mean, everybody's already aware of you now because you've been jumping in. This has been fantastic. I love, I love when everybody's involved in the conversation there. We're getting lots of interaction from everybody making their comments as well. So tell us about yourself, Lindsay. What's, uh, what's, what's the Scottish Design Exchange all about? Um, well, I actually started the Scottish Design Exchange five years ago, come July. Um, and it was pretty much after the last recession, actually. 
um, when we saw lots of empty property around uh, commercial property. Um, and, you know, we'd kind of went through that <clears throat> peak and then a big drop. Um, so I tried to look at a retail model, a high street model, that would benefit more people, so ben benefit the, the majority rather than shareholders and um, largely paid directors. Um, <laughs> So I came up with a model where the artists would keep 100% of, of what they sell. Um, so we run two bank accounts. So we have the artist bank account. Um, and we would look at the cost, the total costs of running um, and paying our staff well. So paying above mi mi uh, minimum wage. And how we could then rent that space to the, the artists um, and run, run the business to support them. So what we do is um, a little bit different from normal retail where we see each individual artist as a business, which they are, um, and we try and support them um, to help them with marketing, help them with build their businesses, um, support them you know, with finance training, anything they kind of need to support that business, um, and let them focus on what they're good at, the making part. Um, so it's been very successful. We started in Ocean Terminal and we got six months free rent in there, which was great. Um, and then we opened um, just over a year ago in Buchanan Galleries. Um, we've paid out over three million pounds to the artists since we started. Um, and in the first year in Buchanan Galleries, uh, we hit the million pound target. So um, that's gone all out to local um, businesses um, from all over Scotland. Um, we support a lot of artists that are in remote areas in Scotland as well, which is very difficult for them to make money out of their art. Um, there's lots of online opportunities, of course, like Etsy, and even last year, um, the, there's a few other um, organized, big organizations that try to get involved in that local market, but they take such a, such a cut. Um, I was speaking to one of the artists the other day, and they were saying on Etsy at the moment, they're making 15% on their sales. Wow. And they've got their Etsy cart, all the costs around the postage, etc. Um, a lot of the local sort of shops take 60%. Art galleries can take up to 60%. And these artists just can't make a living out of that. Incredible. So um, uh, you, you've been able to support a lot of artists. How are, how are all the artists doing at the moment during lockdown? It's very hard, very hard for them. Um, it's a bit of a spotlight on what's happening across the country. We've got 300 artists and, you know, some are, are OK and doing in, in a good position and are able to access grant funding. And some are doing really badly and can't access anything. They're falling through the gaps. So it's, it's really difficult. Um, we're trying to stick together as a community. We have our, our uh, Facebook group where we try and support one another. Um, but yes, it's been very hard. And so tell us about the kind of ethical shopping aspect of what you do then. Uh, how does that work in practice? There's a, a couple of things. Um, most of the time when you speak about ethical shopping, you think of sort of fair trade, you know, buying from um, possibly abroad. And um, what, what I see as ethical shopping is buying as local as possible um, and supporting your local e uh, economy. So really the main goal of the Scottish Design Exchange was to have an impact on the Scottish economy. That was the sort of bigger picture for us. Um, so, you know, we um, have a lot of artists that are very local, but, you know, Scotland's a small country. So if you're buying from our artists, you really are having an impact. Um, but we also support um, 16 social enterprises and charities. Um, they get free space from us. And what we try to do with them is help them build a product, product range to sell, so that they can continuously have uh, regular funding coming into their, their uh, organization. Um, that's paid out about 60,000 pounds in, into their businesses since we started. Um, and that supports um, charities like Gal Gale in Glasgow who help long-term unemployed men. Um, there's Blank Faces, who's a, a small homeless charity in, um, in Glasgow. Um, Miss, Miss and Mrs, who help young women, empowering young women. Um, and these have this regular income for them is really important, you know, so they can make up to a couple of thousand pounds per month um, that they can regularly rely on or had been able to rely on. Um, and I think that's something that we really need to look at. Um, the one thing that we do is we try and make that product a good product. So people buy it because of the product first, you know, they want to buy the product and then um, the added bonus is that that is um, providing funding for the charity. 
Incredible. Wow. So, uh, and at the moment, so a lot of the art that you do is not just about helping the artists, it's also about uh, supporting local charities as well. So you've got some uh, interesting initiatives coming up as well during the, during the lockdown. Yeah, we do. Um, we have a charitable arm which we put money into to help. Um, we actually run free art classes for, for children. Um, we were due to work with the YMCA locally in Leith over the Easter holidays. We were due to start with them. Um, they work with a group of children in Leith who have been identified as suffering from um, holiday hunger, which is a horrible way of putting it. But um, they work with the local schools and identify these children and they come along to the holiday club. Um, and they do fun activities through the holidays, but the main aim, aim is that they get a really good lunch. Um, their families are involved as well, you know, families and the other children in the family can come along too. Um, so we were due to run the art classes there and our, um, our way of doing that was making sure that the artists got paid for the work that they do run in the classes, but the classes were free for the children. Um, Unfortunately, due to the lockdown, um, that's all stopped, but also the work the YMCA um, are doing has stopped. So they've very quickly um, changed tactics and they're now um, taking shopping and food and activities to these children, their families in their homes. Um, and I've been helping out with that. And um, the first couple of weeks of the lockdown, I felt a bit useless. So I spoke to the artists and see if we could um, maybe donate, if they could donate some um, artwork that I could hold a raffle um, online to try and raise money for the YMCA to keep this project going. Yeah, so you've got the raffle coming up and that's, that's going to be exciting. You've got, uh, you've got a lot of donations as well. The, the artistic community has come together and they've, they've provided a lot of artwork to support this prize draw. Yeah, they've been they've been great, and it's it's been a really thing to get nice thing to get involved in with artists. So we've got from original paintings that some of them donated to um, some of the products like um, soap sets and prints um, and sort of everything in between. So we've had over seventy donations from the artists now. So we're really hoping that we can um, you know do something really nice and raise some money um, for this local project. And, the, and that's for the YMCA in, uh, in Edinburgh, in Leith? It's the YMCA Edinburgh, but they're based in Leith. Yeah. And the work that they do is around the Leith area. Yeah. So they also have a group for women. And so women come along and cook and make meals once a week there. Um, and women that are suffering from um, social isolation, actually. So they're also supporting those women in their homes. Um, and they also run a mentoring group for um, children that are in care. Um, and there's a, a thing called care in the home where children have been identified as having issues, but they're still within the home and their mentor goes along to them once a week and the mentor stays with them right through till they're 18. It's a really great, great project. Um, so it's very difficult for them just now. Um, obviously, being stuck in the house um, compounds the issues that were there before. Um, and Mike Catcher, who um, runs the YMC, was telling me about a phone call he got right in the beginning from a lady who had just had a baby. She has two young children, she's on her own. Um, and she called Mike up and said that she had no food, no baby formula, no nappies, um, and can't leave the house. So Mike had gone actually with his own money that day, went and bought some shopping for her and went along. Um, so they're getting phone calls every day, um, but they also link up with the other projects, the Citadel, um, who are delivering food. I'm going to deliver food with them this afternoon um, and the Pilmeni group. So um, I was speaking to Anne from the Pilmeni group yesterday and she said the food banks are empty. The food bank here in um, um, the Madeira Street, I think, the church, they've closed because it's run by a lot of elderly people mm -hmm. and they have to socially isolate. She had to go to Easter Road and they were out, out of food. You know, they had, they had food, but very basics. Um, so they're finding it very difficult to get their hands on food for these families. Can I, can I come in there with a suggestion? Okay. Yeah. I speak to you and Aitken at Cyrenians. <clears throat> okay. So he's involved with the fair share and they're getting a lot of, I guess maybe because they're a bit bigger through fair share, they're getting a lot of stuff directed towards them. So just... That's great, thanks Helen. Helen, Helen. I think the, I think the issue just now, you know, this happened very quickly, but mm -hmm. 
what we've seen is it's the grassroots projects that are holding things up and that we're able to react quickly, but you know, they don't have the money to do this. This is not what they normally do. Um, apparently the council is trying to resolve something just now for the, um, to get hold of food, but it's been very slow. Um, you know, and I've been getting phone calls. Um, I've got to go and deliver some things to a woman today who's in a, um, a hostel. Um, and I actually had a phone call as well that there's five students from India um, living in Leith who can't get home and they've got no food. Um, so without these community groups, um, there would be people starving. Wow, that's crazy. Wow. So, so tell us, actually, Lindsay. I mean, you're 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 young. You're vibrant. How did you get into this into this world? Because I mean, one of one of the premises of uh, She Means Business Scotland is to is to help women who are thinking about being in business or are starting up in business and bringing in role models such as you guys today. Uh, what, what was your journey? Did you ever think that this was what you would ultimately end up doing? Um, no, not really. Um, I spent 11 years in Holland and I worked for Shell actually <laughs> out there in Nokia and tech companies. Um, but there was always something in me, um, a social aspect, you know, and looking at the world in a different way. Um, and, you know, I went through the dot-com bubble, not that young. <laughs> um, and you know, the recessions, you know, and you see that um, you think things are going to get better and they don't. Everybody just sort of goes back to the way that they were before. Um, and when after the last recession, you know, I actually tried to start a company called A Space to Share, which is a bit like Airbnb um, in, in that way, where it was for commercial businesses that rather than taking a risk on taking a property, at least in a property yourself, that you got together with other businesses and shared the space, um, you know, shared the, um, the cost of everything and worked together. Um, and people just couldn't get their head around that at the time. You know, they just weren't, <clears throat> weren't open to that idea. So the Scottish Design Exchange actually came from that, where I thought, well, I'm going to have to show how it works myself. And sort of five years later, <laughs> here I am wow. still running that. Um, you know, my hope is that now, this time, people will be more open to this, you know, and I think, I hope there is a more community feel and people are opening their hearts up a little bit to what's happening. Um, I think one of the disappointments I've seen just now is how much money has been donated to the NHS. Um, I, I get the sentiment of that, but, you know, local community projects are, are really, really struggling, you know. And for Helen's uh, project, you know, if, if these millions of pounds were being put into what you're trying to do, not into the NHS, it should be supported by the government. Um, you know, I, I think people want to help, but they don't know how to help. And I think that's something that women can do at the moment and, um, you know, shine lights on some of these projects and maybe guide some of this money to the right place. Brilliantly put. So on that note, Lindsay, let us know how can people help you and uh, where can they get hold of you if they want to be able to contact you with some support? Um, probably best is to look through the website, it's the Scottish Design Exchange um, and um, on social media because we're going to be uh, launching our um, fundraiser by the end of next week. So keep an eye out for that. If you want to contact me direct, my email address is lindsay and it's L-Y-N-Z-I. Um, at stx.scot. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Wow, what, 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 what a great couple of guests we've had so far. Uh, we've never had uh, in the She Means Business Scotland uh, so many kind of charity and social enterprise emphasis. And, I, and I'm, I'm loving it because at the, end, at the end of the day, She Means Business is about women who are making shit happen. And I think, as you're saying, Lindsay and Helen, that when women actually, you know, get together and start collaborating and making things happen we actually build a, a, a society which is built on a different kind of fundamentals which is a lot more, lot more local based and collaboration based as well i was involved in a, a big high-powered uh, event last night where it was you know we had the military we had uh, the cia we had a whole bunch of different people on, on the discussion and everybody's looking for solutions to to even bring potentially collapse the whole globalization issue because that's making local projects and local situations very difficult to sustain when everybody else is able to actually 
uh, deliver it at cheaper prices. But then when we're in a crisis like this, what happens to the local supply chain? Do you know what I mean? Anyway, so let's uh, let me, let's move on and have a chat with Sabia Boraji, uh, who I've known for uh, several. Well, is it as much as a year? It feels like it feels oh, like yeah. we've known each other for a long time now. Uh, so Sabia, come along and introduce yourself. Then. So hi everyone. My name is Sabia Boraji. I'm I'm the CEO of High Value Woman. And I help women to um, release their fears, own their worth, and ask for what they want um, in their careers or in their lives. Um, I've worked in HR for, oh gosh, over 20 years now, um, kind of internationally. And my work started through my, my own career, but predominantly I was noticing, because I work kind of in the salary and the benefits and the bonus space, and I was really noticing that a lot of my conversations around asking for pay rises and promotions and things like that were coming from men. And I was kind of like, what's going on here? Where are all the women? Why are they not talking to me? Um, so I started running. I was lucky that I was in Australia at the time and I was working from international companies and they were open enough because it was the gender uh, pay gap in Australia was big news at that time, which was probably about a good 13, 14 years ago now. Um, and I started holding workshops and, you know, lunchtime sessions and actually talking to the women and saying, so how come you're not coming and talking to me? So as head of reward, I can give you advice on what's the best way to ask for these things. And I just heard so many things. I thought, oh, right, okay, I need to do a whole bunch of myth busting around how do you actually ask in these environments? And that was kind of really where my work started. Um, and I started High Value Woman probably about six years ago because um, I was still working in corporate and I still am working in the civil service now. But it's something that is just such a, a passion project that I think it will just continue for the rest of my life. So, what would you say are the main barriers to women? being able to uh, achieve, uh, let's call it, uh, uh, the same kind of levels of uh, pay as guys do? My, my experience, especially having worked in the reward space, so I've, I've been on the other side of the table. The biggest one that I would say is that structurally, um, women, women don't ask because actually structurally we make it very hard for women to ask because there's been a lot of research done over the last 10 years which has actually shown that women who do ask or women who are perceived as um what they're being assertive but actually they're perceived as being aggressive there's actually a lot of backlash to women who actually ask so very early on in my own career because I worked in reward, I would actually be sitting on all these senior meetings and I'd watch the men negotiate and I'd be like, oh, that's an interesting way of doing it. And I'd be taking notes and then I would utilize that in my own career. And I was a contractor, so I was constantly negotiating. And when I would share with my friends what I was asking for and what I was receiving, because most of the time, if I asked, I got, um, a lot of my friends would actually say, oh, th but that's, that's a bit, been a bit greedy, isn't it? Or gosh, how could you ask for that? And I'm thinking, well, and I would say to a lot of, interestingly enough, a lot of times it was my female friends. And I would say to them, I said, so would you say that to me if I was a guy? And they'd be like, oh, no, actually, that's a really good point. So within, I think, our culture and our society and the way we're raised, I think women automatically and very deeply unconsciously tend to negate themselves because they think that's actually what makes them appear to be selfless and caring and all of these things. But actually, in the work environment, we get punished for those behaviors. And actually we, ha we end up with things like the gender gap and we end up with things like the actual pay gap where women are effectively for the whole of their life always behind the eight ball. And when they get to the point when they're retiring, they can be significantly behind the eight ball, which for me working in reward, I love numbers. When I'm looking at that kind of thing, I'm like, you know what, I can't, I can't bear this to see that when women struggle financially, it has such a huge impact on their lives. It was like, no, I've got to do something about it. I've got to get behind the things that are getting in the way of women asking and then help them to actually ask. And then obviously from a practical perspective, it's very much around, so how do you navigate all of the things kind of within your organizations to actually get the outcomes that you're looking to get? And the issue is not necessarily that it's about a corporate problem. It's more, it's, it's often a social problem. So when women have a divorce, for example, they're, they're very reluctant to fight for 
they're Jews. They, they just want to be able to have, you know, the basics to be able to uh, cater for the kids and everything like that. Whereas the guys are, if they don't fight, the guys often get the better deal. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because a lot of my work, whilst it kind of starts in the professional area, always spills out into the personal. Because one of the things that I found is when I'm talking to women, you know, one of the big premises around my work is around helping them to release their fears. So I always say to my clients, whether it was in a, usually it's in a professional context, and I'll say, so what are the things that you're afraid of that's actually stopping you from asking or from doing the thing that you want to do. And a lot of times fear is something that unless we talk about it becomes this huge, big nebulous thing. And we can't actually put our finger on what it is that's actually scaring us. So one thing, first thing I say to my clients is, okay, you know, I want you to make a list of all the things that you're actually afraid of in terms of asking for this or whatever it might be. Just make that list and go down it and look at it and tell, ask yourself how much of that is really true for you. Because I've had clients, they'll make a list of 10, 20 things and they'll go that and they'll be like, no, that's not mine. That's, that's for my mom or no, that's not mine. And they will go through and they'll say, well, do you know what? Half of that is not even my shit. It's, it's somebody else's shit and I'm carrying it along. And I'm like, well, you know, sometimes you can just get rid of a lot of fear just because you look at it. So, um, Neil Donald Walsh in his brilliant series of books, Conversations with God, says, you know, what you resist persists, what you look at disappears. So sometimes by actually looking at the things that we're afraid of, we actually see the truth of them and we can say, that's just bullshit. I'll get rid of that one. And then actually, then you can actually focus on the things that really scare you. And one of the things I say to my clients is, look at it, look at the thing that's scaring you and actually ask yourself, what is it about it that's scaring you? Start picking it apart because the minute you start picking it apart, you might find old beliefs that again, aren't yours. There might just be bad experiences that you had that have now become a reference for your future. And it's like, but that happened in the past. It doesn't mean it has to equal your future. So it's those kind of things that when we start picking our fears apart, we actually move ourselves into a space where you think that's not my truth. And actually I'm now free to figure out what is my truth in this space. Amazing. So what else would you suggest that we do? Everybody, I can see everybody's busy writing notes about what we need to be doing to make sure we're asking the right questions of ourselves and everybody else. What else, what else do you recommend? So, so, so number one is, you know, make that list of the things that you're afraid of and actually just go through it and look at it and ask yourself, is this true for me? Or is this something that I'm holding on to and I really need to let go of now? And one of the things I'd say is when you've done that, actually look at that and see yourself beyond your fears. So sometimes we can get so caught up in our fears that we can't see beyond them, but actually have a look at, you know, what would happen if those fears, you didn't have those fears, like would you actually do the things that you want to do or say the things that you want to say or ask for the things that you want? So that's a really powerful thing is sometimes to just look beyond them and then go back and you know, do the work to, to go through them. The next thing I'd say is um, kind of my principles on three things. So releasing your fears. And then the next one is around owning your worth. One of the best exercises that um, I came up with, and it was actually through a conversation with my, I think he was about five years old at the time, nephew. And I remember saying to him something like, um, Fionn, wh wh why do you want that? And he's like, because I do. And I was just like, I, I love that. That is such a brilliant thing. Like children don't ever feel they need to justify themselves when they want something. And I thought, that's really interesting. I said, you know, a lot of women that I've worked with will say to me that, well, I can't ask for that because, or I can't ask for this because. So I kind of turned it on the head and I said, okay, I want you to make a list of all the things and say, I deserve this because, and just write down why you actually deserve it. And I want you to write uh, as many of those things as you can until you get to a point where you write, I deserve whatever it is because full stop, just yeah. full stop. And then the last one is, I deserve this, full stop. So, you know, when we within ourselves can get to a point where we don't need to justify why we want something or why we feel like we deserve it, we're starting to build something within us that says, you know what, I need to stop this self-justification because who am I justifying it to? I mean, granted, in, a, in an organization, when you go for a pay rise, you might need to do a bit of rationale and a bit of a business case. But when it comes to our personal lives and asking something from a family member or from our partners, it's like, 
why do you feel like you have to justify your desire or your need? Whereas I've worked with, I have male clients who that to them is just a completely alien concept. They'd be like, well, what, why would I do that? Of course, of course I'm, I'm deserve that. And I'm like, you know, such a different mindset. Absolutely. And uh, you also have a, a fantastic book that you've got uh, out to help people. Um, shameless uh, plug, shameless yeah. plug. Shameless plug, six steps to six figures as well. But so where can people get hold of that? Um, so you can get, uh, if you go to my website, which is highvaluewoman.org, um, you can order a, a copy of the book from there and it will come from one of the online retailers. So tell us, Libya, I mean, one of the things I love about you is the, the, is the way that you come from a very kind of spiritual perspective as well. Tell us about your journey. I mean, when you were a little girl, did you ever imagine or did you have to fight against uh, uh, prejudices against women, perhaps, uh, in order to get to where you are now? Did you ever see yourself being here? I probably didn't ever see myself being here. Um, so I grew up in a very traditional Indian Muslim background. And I know it from, from, dot, from point dot, my dad always says to me that I never listened to what anyone would say. No one could tell me who I was or how I was gonna be. I was very contrary. Um, my, dad's, my dad always uses that word. He says, no, you're not stubborn, you're just contrary. And I'm like, no, I, you know, I was rebel with a cause. Um, but from a very growing up in that kind of patriarchal culture, it was all the time. It was like, no, you can't have that. No, you can't ask that. You're a girl. You're a girl. You're a girl. And I just, it used to just make me angrier and angrier um, to the point where I think, you know, equality and things around gender have just been something that I've grown up with and fought against all my life. And what I've realized, I think, within my own culture is that for women, when we empower ourselves, you know, physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually, then I'm, on, I'm not in a position where anyone can actually try and push me down. When, especially financially, if a woman doesn't have financial ability to actually stand on her own two feet, then she is at the mercy of people around her. And I see that in my culture a lot. And it really makes me angry because... When I was growing up, I was lucky that my parents believed in education, but a lot of um, girls that I knew, their parents absolutely did not believe in education for girls. So most of them would have been married very young, had children. A lot of them are actually divorced now and financially struggling. And I'm, you know, I'm like, well, I was lucky. I, I went to university. I've had a corporate career. I'm still working. I'm financially standing on my own two feet. I was like, I'm not beholden to anyone and I'm not at the mercy of other people, which don't make it sound, make it sound like, you know, you can't rely on other people, but when your whole life is de dependent on other people um, making the rules for you as women, you know, that's just, for me, it's just inherently um, incorrect because it just means that we, we don't have the ability to live our own lives and be there for the people that we want to be there for. Amazing. So uh, how would you recommend that people uh, actually start navigating this particular uh, virus, you know, the lockdown? Because obviously, you know, this is this is bringing up a lot of demons, you know, what you were talking about earlier was I, I had the vision of people slaying their demons, slaying their, their dragons, their monsters. You know, this this time where you're being locked in almost and you don't have time for you're forced to do a lot of self-reflection that can bring up a lot of demons. What would you recommend for people who are, who are struggling at this time? Because, you know, this is, this is, this is tough times for many people. Yeah. I'm, I'm a total introvert. So I have to admit, I've, my, my dad, my dad said to me, he's like, because I bet you're loving this. I was like, I am. I was like, I'm meditating, I'm journaling, I'm doing my yoga. I'm like, this is brilliant. Um, one of the things that I find is I think I've been talking interestingly to a lot of people in my friends and my family. And I think one of the things that's been really interesting is that this virus has brought up a real existential fear. You know, um, somebody was saying to me, God, you know, I could just go out and, you know, I could just, somebody could cough on me and I could die. And I was like, do you know what that, whilst that seems really extreme, I was like, if that's the level of existential fear that you have, I was like, and I'll be honest with you, I, I, I suffer from asthma. So I was like, oh my God. But one of the things that it made me do is the work that I do around fear is that the more we 
push fear away, the more we, um, we resist it, the bigger it actually comes, which is why I always say that sometimes looking your, fa your fear in the face is really useful because what it has made me do when I think about um, something as existential as a virus killing you very, very quickly, I thought to myself, you know, what is it that um, it scares me about this? And I said, losing my life. And I was like, so if, for example, I lost my life, what would what would be the terror behind that? And I, you know, it really, it kind of made me cry, but I thought, actually, my biggest regret would be that I didn't get a chance to hug my family and friends. And I thought, you know what, I'm looking at everything, I'm like, I'm looking at my work, I'm looking at all the things that I have, and I'm like, as beautiful and wonderful and abundant as that is, the only thing that I would really miss is the fact that I didn't get to hug the people that I love. And I thought, okay, once this lockdown is over, I'll be hugging everyone for sure. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not really a hugger. I'm not, I'm like, mm, kind of keep your space. But like now I'll be like hugging everyone. But it kind of started to bring into perspective for me, what are the things that really matter to us? What do we really value beyond the mm. things that we see in our life? Because sometimes, you know, the things that we have can distract us from the things that we really value, which is actually our relationships. Um, so one of the things I said to some of my friends, I said, you know, really take this time to think about what's important for you as an individual, as a woman, because most of my conversations with women, as a woman, what's important to you in your career? You know, is it because you, you want to get ahead because you want to become more of yourself? Because for a lot of my clients, they wanted to get ahead because they wanted to prove to themselves. And I was like, why do you need to prove your worth to yourself? You're here you do an amazing job, like Helen and like Lindsay, it's like you do an amazing job, you contribute so much, and yet you want to succeed and accomplish to prove to yourself that you can. So it's like, you know what, forget that idea, do what you do because you want to bring more of you out, do what you do because you love it and because you want to serve and because you want to contribute, but forget this idea that actually it's going to somehow um, talk about your worth or your value. It's like, that is a given, that's your starting point. It's like, you know, grow and expand and evolve and blossom into whoever you want to be, because that's actually who you already are. You just need to step into it. Amazing, wow, what a note to finish on. So Sabia, tell us about where we, people can get hold of you, if they're looking for some coaching or support or they want to be able to buy your book basically. Yeah, so if you go to my website, which is uh, highvaluewoman.org, um, you can contact me through there. And there's lots of things on the website that I'm sure you'll find interesting. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, on that note, we're going to have to wrap up. We're just coming rapidly towards uh, half past one there. I'd like to give my heartfelt thanks to our amazing guests today. We've had Lindsay Leroy of the Scottish Design Exchange. Sabia Voraji of the, the High Value Woman and Helen Carlin of Rowan Alba. So next week we've got a, a training session. We've got some social media training. We've got using creative tools to advance your content on mobile. So how to make the most out of your mobile in order to put all your content together, basically. So that should be a good, a good little workshop to uh, break up. So that basically happens once every month. And then we go back to the fantastic interviews that we've got with all our inspirational women in Scotland. So please come and join us now at the same time next week and uh, stay safe and uh, support each other as we grow through this crisis. Thank okay. you. On that note, thank you so much, everybody. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>